Okay. All right. Hey, everybody. Good to have you tonight. We're, we're, um, we're glad to be back with you. Um, like I said, we were in New Bern this past weekend with Pastors Cal and Nita Langford and had a wonderful time down there and a powerful service and what a wonderful congregation to be with. I heard you guys were in really, really good hands with Jess and Cap sharing about their trip to Turkey, their ministry trip to Turkey, and um, that, was, that was awesome. Um, don't forget this weekend. Everybody say this weekend. Homecoming and um, church dedication. Amen. Homecoming and church dedication. We're excited. Um, so all of our, um, you know, people who, who've been here in the past, you're welcome, you're invited to come join us for homecoming. And, uh, and then we're going to move into the dedication service. And then we're having Sid Wills on the ground. Hallelujah. I believe we've ordered meatloaf and broasted chicken, mashed potatoes and gravy and cabbage and cornbread. We've got somebody making um, green beans, I believe it is, and somebody making um, uh, mac and cheese to go with that, along with sweet tea, of course. Got to have sweet tea, right? Yeah, the wine of the South, all right? And um, unfermented sweet tea, by the way. <clears throat> you don't want fermented sweet tea. <laughs> anyway, you see tea that it starts getting that sugary whatever in it, and you're like, ooh, that's nasty. Anyway. Um, but that's this Sunday, and uh, Dean, uh, the Dean of Rama, that Tad Gregorich, will be with us uh, doing our Sunday morning service and our dedication service. So we're real excited about that, and everybody say, God is good. <clears throat> um, a few things we need to get done before this weekend, make sure we need to get the church cleaned up. I, uh, the, our sign for Victory Overlook is ready, so i got to get that uh, get the whole post hole, get it in the ground, get it mounted. Uh, we need to get these um, barriers between the bumpers and the gravel and the grass area put in uh, to hold the, gra the gravel back and stuff and, um, you know, things like that, okay? And um, we'll work on the rest of the stuff this week and try to make sure we have everything ready to go for that this special, special service. So, um, you know, homecoming and church dedication at the same time um, you know, I'm just going to kind of let you on it. We'll say this again on Sunday, but we're going to be having, uh, homecoming. We'll be looking at, at the past church dedication is looking to the future. Amen. And so we, we're in the present. So we'll be looking to the past for the foundation, of which we're launching into our new future, uh, with our, our land and building here and the call that God has for us and the things we're, we're, uh, we're walking in and continue to walk in and fulfill uh, in the kingdom of God. Um, praise the Lord. I'm excited. I am excited. Hallelujah. <clears throat> uh, I'm almost run around the building a couple of times. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's going to be good. We're very excited about what God's doing and, and, the, um, and the door we have now and the places we're going and um, the things that God is speaking and, um, you know, our, that our heart is connected to. And, um, the uh, excitement of other people that, you know, ministries and stuff that have supported us through this process and been part of it. Uh, we are uh, just thrilled to be ready to go. Amen. All right. We're continuing on um, the supernatural church. Uh, Dean Tad was just preaching at the uh, Rama commencement um, services for the beginning of the school year. And I, I, don't, I don't know if Jesse posted out of her thing or not, but he was preaching uh, really along the lines we've been preaching on um, about the, the supernatural church, about the age of the church that we're in right now, the need for the, the, uh, the manifestations and gifts of the Spirit to be in operation, um, the need for us as individuals to be supernatural soul winners, to go out and win the lost, amen, to be going and doing the will of God and the work of God and the purposes of God all over the world, amen. And, uh, but he was preaching about, the, uh, he said this one statement, we have no right to preach a cessation gospel. Meaning, we have no right to preach the gospel without the gifts and power of the Holy Ghost and manifestation and working with us. Because it is, as Paul said, I came not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of of God. Hallelujah. It's going to take supernatural to win this generation. It's going to take supernatural to win old generations who've rejected Christ all these years. 
uh, in order for the gospel to be cross-generational and reach the young, the middle, the old, it's going to have to be supernatural. Amen? <clears throat> it cannot be mental. It cannot be, um, you know, philosophical. It's got to be supernatural. The church is a supernatural church. And um, so anyway, we're, we were, we're, sharing, we're going through the book of Acts and sharing some of the supernatural events. And as we've said before, this is not the books, this is not the Acts of the Holy Ghost. This is the Acts of the early church anointed by the Holy Ghost and a pattern for the modern church. Amen. What we were birthed in is what we're finishing in. It was birthed in a blaze of glory. We're going out in a blaze of glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we started covering different signs, wonders, and miracles in the book of Acts. And um, we got through Acts, um, let me see, I'm trying to remember which, where I left off two weeks ago. Uh, Acts 3, 4, Acts 4. Let's move into Acts 5. Now, one of the things we never like to talk about, particularly in charismatic word of faith churches, under extreme grace, teaching is that judgment there was supernatural judgment in the book of acts hello we don't like to talk about that god's good god's a god of love god is good god is a god of love and what, what we know is this that for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life he gave the answer to the sin and the rebellion, and that was his son, to avoid judgment. Amen. But there is still judgment. And I, let me say, judgment begins at the house of the Lord. And, and just if you're watching as a minister, remember this, and it starts with the leaders of the house of the Lord. Remember in the temple, how the, you know, the fire, the glory of the Lord came down in Leviticus. And, um, you know, the, and, and sanctified and separated the temple. And the next thing we had, the very next chapter, the sons of Aaron offer strange fire and were struck down for offering strange fire in the temple. And Moses had told him to shut up, don't say anything about this. Because if you, basically if you do, you're going to encounter that. So Aaron had to hold his peace. I'm sure he wasn't happy, but his sons offered strange fire. And God couldn't have that. Okay. So, but let's look at Acts chapter 5. We see the very first act. We'll say, well, but the love message is it wins people. Let's, we'll find out something here in this one, too. Listen, I'm not about, you know, listen, I grew up Pentecostal. We would leave church services with the smell of brimstone and smoke on our clothes. I mean, they would preach the flames of hell right up to, to scare you into heaven. I've been in those services. Man, you're thinking, man, I better get saved or I'm, I'm, I'm toast. Literally. To okay, come on, guys. All right. So we're not majoring on judgment, but at the same time, we have to understand that God wants to work his supernatural works and an impure church will short circuit the work of God. Now God's merciful to those who are fighting or struggling with something, but judgment will come on the obstinate and the hard hearted and the rebellious. Now, if you can't say amen or can't even muster up an old me, go ahead and grunt. Not even a grunt. Okay. Well, I'm right. Okay. All right. Acts chapter 5. Let's look into there. So church is, I mean, the church is going and blowing. And, I mean, it's just booming. Things are happening. And um, but a certain man, well, let's back up, let's back up just a little bit. Verse 33 of the previous chapter. And with great power, there it is again, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection. See, we expect people to believe in the resurrection simply because we told them that Jesus is alive. They, with great power, 
gave witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands, of houses, sold them, and brought the prices of those things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now remember, when a Jew became a believer, they were, they were, they were ostracized. They were excommunicated from their families. They lost everything. People wouldn't hire them. Okay? Now, obviously, there were wealthy people who got saved, and so they, they created a collection where they took care of each other for the furtherance of, of, the, of the church. Um, neither of them lack, among them lack, for the many of the possessors of lands and houses sold them, brought the prices of the things that were sold, laid them at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made to every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who, was, uh, um, who by the apostles was named Barnabas, which is being by interpretation the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, brought it money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. All right. So this is going on in the church. And they're bringing money in, and they're putting it into a treasury to meet the needs of the church community who's going through great persecution by their own kinsfolk because they had turned to Christ. But a certain man, and here we are right in the middle of the, a revival, of people, be, well, it's probably not a revival. It is, the, it is the beginning of the church. It is, you know, the big early stages of the church. People are getting born again. They're losing their family connections. They're coming into the church. The church is taking care of them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Reestablish a new community, a community of believers. Hallelujah. And people are just, you know, they're doing what they're doing, what they're doing because they love God, and this is necessary. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it. And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, let me say this. Had he come in and said, look, I sold it for 1000 but I'm only bringing 500 that wouldn't have been a problem. He gave it under deception. He gave it under a deceptive means whereby to look whatever he's Putting that money, and everybody, well, oh, look, he gave out, but he kept back part of it for himself. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine, in thine own power? Now, why have you conceived this thing in thine heart that thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God? Now, notice he says here, it was all right for you to have it. It was all right for you to sell it. It was not all right to give into the church under false pretense. You're bringing a deceptive spirit into the, the work of God. And we can't afford that. The church can't afford that. Oh, but God loves people. He's under grace. and you know, Well, that grace didn't keep him from getting zapped. Are you here? I mean, in today's church, we would say uh, God would not have struck. They would say this probably isn't even part of the Bible. This was, this was added later. They, they got scholars that say uh, this really is in the original text. I wrote some bozo. I saw him put it a couple of years ago, you know, that the book of James is not accepted as canon by all today's modern scholars. All, all, not optative word, all. What, which, which two? Hello? We've got 2,000 years. Well, not quite 2,000 years, but, you know, 1,960 years of, of acceptance of things. And you're going to come along now and go, all scholars agree that James shouldn't be in the Bible because it disagrees with Paul's narrative on grace. We, can't, we don't change the Bible because it doesn't agree with what you like. Hello? I love the grace of God. I do not like the grace of God, as James said. They didn't like James on this one. Jude says, Jude says um, that they turned it into a lasciviousness or lasciviousness. Wantonness. That's what that word means in the Greek. Wantonness. Because it, it, it aligns with their narrative. No. He walks in and does it, and immediately, see, this is supernatural running the church. 
Peter immediately goes, why did Satan get you to lie? Now, you know he's thinking, oh, I'm in trouble now. Got your mail read in church. But you have not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. Now, modern-day English, he fell over dead. Okay? And great fear came upon all them that heard these things. It does not help the church when we bring in and, and, and let people be married as homosexuals or lesbians, when we accept um, perverse lifestyles as normal in the church under the guise of love, because those people don't change. The church changes. The church becomes soft in the realm of sin. The church doesn't uh, stand up and take its place. Hello? And in doing so, damns those people to the consequences of their sin. So that's not love. Love wants to liberate and to set free. It does not damn them into their sin by accepting it and condoning it and appreciating it and saying it's normal. Hello. True love says repent. Amen. Go and, go and, um, <clears throat> go and sin no more. The words of the master. Y'all hear you going home. But condoning sin has become <clears throat> such a narrative in the church because we love people. Okay. But love <coughs> brings the answer to liberation and to be set free, not to enforce that spirit and that sin into that person's life where they think it's okay. Although their heart's telling them it's not okay. You put numbing, you, you, you basically you are putting morphine on the ache of the heart by condoning the sin so that they don't feel in their own heart they're wrong. And Satan will use, <coughs> use those people to work in those people's lives to keep them bound. If you truly love people, you'll tell them the truth. Because Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And truth is unchangeable. Truth is eternal. Truth does not change with generations or with um, um, the times or what group we have out there now. Baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, um, whatever, you know, all the different. We, I, I don't know when we started doing this. We started with baby boomers, coming up with titles for this generation, this particular generation that's out there right now. You know, I think, I think Gen Z is what we're at right now. What happens after Gen Z? We don't have any more letters in the alphabet. We need to have a Gen B A. A Gen born again. And then a B and a B H G baptized in the Holy Ghost. Amen. And then DMs, disciple makers. That's the kind of generations we need. Amen. So um, here we have in, in today's church. <coughs> <clears throat> Nothing would have happened to Ananias or Sapphira. They would have been told in private, we commend you for your lie. Of course, the way some spiritual leaders are, they wouldn't know because God, they, they wouldn't have known the Holy Ghost talking to them if he hit them in the head with a baseball bat. But Peter's, I mean, they walk in and do this. Actually, Ananias walks in and does this. Peter goes, why did you lie to the Holy Ghost? 
And uh, the young man rose, wound him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now, his wife, they didn't have cell phones in these days. It had been on Facebook. I mean, there would have been people in, in the church doing like this. It had been on Facebook in 20 seconds. Hello. And about the space of three hours later, uh, or after us, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in, Peter said unto her, <coughs> Tell me. Whether ye sold the land for so much, she said, yea, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them that buried thy husband, she gets to find out right before she dies, he's dead, are at the door, and they shall carry thee out. And straightway, she, and she fell down straightway at his feet, yielded up the ghost, Young men came in, found her dead, carried her forth, and buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon all, as many as heard these things. And by the hands of the apostles were signs and wonders wrought among the people. And these were all with one accord in Solomon's port. And the rest durst no man join themselves unto them, but magnified them. And believers were added more to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women, Listen to this. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, laid their beds on couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. And there came a multitude out of the cities round about, bringing sick folks, and them with them vexed with unclean spirits, and were healed every one. So God stops in its tracks deception and lying in the church then miracle signs and wonders take place. People are getting healed. Multitudes are added to the church. It wasn't the narrative of God loves you. It doesn't matter what you do. It's not, nothing's going to happen to you. It was there's not going to be sin in the church. You understand what I mean? This is purposeful, deceptive sin. It, was, it wasn't you went home and you had a problem. You're, you're dealing with it and you're, you know, your heart's repeating. You're not. This, this is affecting the whole church. That spirit was being brought into the church. Hello. And God couldn't allow it. And what happened was it created, even in the fear of what happened, a safe harbor <coughs> knowing Listen, all the junk going on in the church today, pastors committing adultery, pedophiles, homosexuality in the pulpit, that's not a safe harbor. Because the spirit on that is in the church. And so people come in, and it's not, instead of finding a safe harbor for liberation and for freedom and the ability to find a place where they can be liberated, they're in a place of, of spiritual oppression that will keep them bound. Amen. Does God love the homosexual? The Bible did not say, for God so loved everybody but. He said he loved the world. He loved them in their sin. He loved them in their fallen state. He loved them in their captivity and bondage. And because he loved them, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then his son said that they would know the truth and the truth would set them free. And Jesus also said, sanctify them through thy word. Sanctify means to separate. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. I like, I heard this the other day. There are facts. Doctor says you've got cancer, six months to live. That might be a fact. But the truth is, by his stripes you were healed. Truth has a higher reality than facts. And you may be bound in sin, sexual perversion and sin. 
might be bound in adultery. You might be bound in pornography. You could be bound in stealing, bound by drugs, bound by alcohol, bound by all kinds of works of the flesh. But the truth will set you free. Jesus said that through the word. Now, if we don't teach the word and don't preach the word, there's no miracle signs and wonders. There's no liberation going on. What happens when the word is preached? The Lord works with us, confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Acts chapter 8. So here, this was a judgment. Wow. Now, one thing that, that happened during our charismatic word of faith, renewal, revival, however you want to label it, <clears throat> was we got flippant about the things of the Spirit. We treated the gifts of the Spirit like a new toy. Now, I grew up Pentecostal. We had an all of the things of the Spirit. So much so that we wouldn't even hook up with the Holy Ghost and flow with it because we were scared we would misuse it. So it was, it, was on the, it was on the ditch over here. Then along comes charismatics, and we're so liberated and so loosey-goosey with it. Um, you understand what I'm saying? You know, it, it wasn't even, it, it, was, it was wrong over this ditch. No respect of the things of the Spirit. When Brother Hagen, and let me say this, every charismatic church in America did it. But when the Spirit of God speaks, he does not need a hand clap. What a marvelous speech. And we've all done it. I've done, I've done it in the past when I was younger. And Brother Hagen, the Spirit of God appeared to him, the Jesus appeared to him before the 1987 camp meeting a week before, and if you've ever read the book Plans, Purposes, and Pursuits, it came out of that meeting, okay? And he appeared to me in there. He said, uh, clapping is neither praise nor worship. It is a form of, um, what did he say? It was a human form of whatever, but it wasn't praise nor worship. And he preached that sermon about bringing brass, substituting brass for gold that whole week. He taught on being substitute. He got a whole camp meeting out of it, that vision with Jesus. And this is in the beginning of when worship was moving to take over as the highlight of our church services. Because if you didn't have rock and worship, people didn't come to your church. You had to have rock and worship. You had to, I mean, you had to have, and, and listen, I'm, 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 I'm saying guilty here because we, we all were there. But this is the new thing. This is what you do. And, um, you know, and now we've gotten to the point you got, you might have rock and worship and you don't even get a sermon that, that, that would uh, get a gnat healed. But you had the experience. You had the worship experience because you were moved emotionally. I understand emotions are part of our uh, makeup, but I'm going to tell you something, folks. If you don't get something that feeds your spirit and develops your spirit and makes your spirit strong, them emotions ain't going to cut the mustard when the, when, the, when the devil shows up and puts your feet where your head was two seconds before. It's not going to help you. I was sharing Sunday in uh, Newburn down with the uh, Langfords. How that when Shannon and Jesse Shannon were at Ramah and Shannon got sick and was dying. I mean, she was she was in. I mean, we're getting phone calls and that, Mama, she's not good. She's I mean, she's turning yellow. Da 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 da. Get her to the hospital. Get her to the hospital. She's got spinal meningitis. I mean, you know. Now, if, if all we ever taught them was pass me not, you know. Or whatever, you know, some of the new stuff you hear and you're like, I can't even sing that because the lyrics are so bad. 
are so watered down or so unfull of anything that I don't even know what to do with it. But it's got the cool rhythms and, you know, beats and whatever of, of, of today that kids like now. But so, okay, we sing that because that, that style ministers to them. But they pray, and then Shannon's laying there, and they're going to run a test, and they're, you know, they're praying in the Holy Ghost. Just as they're praying, lay hands on her. And uh, they start singing, I'm Healed, I'm Whole by David Ingalls. Now, let me say something, folks. I still don't like the style of his music. It don't do a thing for my BG disco vibe. Okay? I mean, absolutely nothing. Or my pre-disco BG folk song vibe. Yeah. I, I'm going back to Massachusetts. Oh, we can, we still cast that out of you. <laughs> Only song that Alice Cooper ever did I like was "Our School's Out Forever." <laughs> okay. But the substance of that song was was word. First Peter two twenty four says we we're healed, and if we were, then I am, I am. Well, after going back and forth for several hours, and every time the doctor would come back, she was better. After, I, I think they, she got over to the hospital around midnight, and about, about 4 o'clock in the morning, they came and said, we can't find anything wrong with her. She's okay. T take her home. And a few hours earlier, she's deathly ill. Well, see, this is why we have to have the supernatural church and put supernatural word into people so they can rise up and win supernatural battles. This attack came on her like that. She went from just being normal in just an hour or so to being like she was about to die. Changed colors and everything. All right. Um, Acts chapter 8, verse 25. Five. Then Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ. And the people with one accord gave heed Unto those things which Philip spake, stop, and get your highlight out and underline the next part. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Why were they giving heed? Because they used their intellectual faith and they were able to uh, understand the intellectual gospel. And, um, are, um, and because they spoke Greek, they didn't have to have the Greek concordance. They were able to fully understand the full meaning of the exegesis of the sermon that he preached on that day. He went down and preached a simple message, and then miracles, signs, and wonders took place, and they gave heed both hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. So devils are getting cast out, and lame folks are walking. All of a sudden, this, this doctrine, this teaching has bite to it because there's a supernatural manifestation of the Spirit of God in connection with the preaching of the gospel. Now, we've been taught for so long in many circles that, you know, this passed away, that God doesn't do that anymore. Um, you know, we, we just need to be, you know, we need to walk, we need just to look. The love narrative, and I, I think we've taken the love narrative to a it place it's not, it's not even biblical love. I don't think I know it. We've taken it over there where it's a, an emotional, worldly love. It's a social love. It's a human. It's not the love of God. See, the love of God says, I love you, and I have provided means to restore you. Human love goes, I love you. You love me. We're a happy family with a great big hug and a kiss from me to you. Won't you say you love me too? Oh, baby, bye. isn't that just wonderful? Yes, Barney. We have Barney in the house tonight. 
Penny's over there in her purple. <laughs> this ain't, ain't so. Say it ain't so, Pastor. <laughs> I couldn't pass that up, Penny. Barney, Barney's a purple dinosaur for the kids' programs. Okay. See, worldly love. But the love of God says, you're bound. I got a message that tells you you can be free. And I brought the power with me, Jesus, the Lord working with me to liberate you and to set you free from that sin. Not, come on in, keep living the way you are. You and your husband, and you're a man, or you and your wife and a woman, and you two women, we just love you. As a matter of fact, our, our pastor is lesbian. And the first lady of the church, her wife, oh, you're such an open-minded church. No, you're an open-going-to-hell church. There's no power to set them free. Hello. Ichabod is written on the doors of the church. There has to be, and we are. We call ourselves the remnant. We are the remnant that will not bow the knee to the spirit of Baal in the world today. To the false prophets who prophesy lies and damnation from the pulpit um, that people are okay to live apart from God's moral code and moral law. No, we come with power. We come with a message of freedom and liberty and the power to de get them devils off of you. Amen. Instead of patting them on the back and saying, it's just wonderful how open-minded this church is. And then, didn't Jesus say something about narrow and straight? Narrow is the way, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. Narrow, not wide open, narrow. Thank you. And there was great joy in the city. Now let's go right into uh, this, right into a double judgment. Amen. And there was a certain man called Simon who before ten time in the same city used sorcery, bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out to himself with some great one, to whom gave all the heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, and in the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. See, he knew how he was doing his. He was blown away by what they were doing because it was coming out of God. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Now, would you all agree with me here that Samaria is born again? Are they born again? Are they water baptized? But when they believed Philip, preaching the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. So would you say these people are, baptized, are born again? I'd say they're born again, right? Now when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now this receiving, or as we refer to it, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, could not have been what happened to them when they believed the Word of God and were baptized. And it was known they had received the Word of God. They're born again believers. For as yet, he was fallen upon none of them, only... They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They're born again. You can't read Scripture and say they weren't. This bunch is born again. And when Simon saw that through the laying on the hands, apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. See, now here we go. Going to try, going to try to use money. Going to try to use the supernatural. For personal, private, uh, 
financial gain. That'd be like us coming here tonight and having somebody in the church front row in a wheelchair, having a building full of people, lay hands on them, they get up and walk, start walking, and I say, we need to receive an offering to glorify God for this great miracle. And by the way, I get 50%. See, God don't put up with that mess. <coughs> and if you want to lose the anointing to minister to people, start doing that stunt. You're going to have to revert to all kinds of other stuff to have things going on, but it won't be God. You'll get, a, you'll get demon spirits involved. That's what happened down at PTL. Guy was getting up every single night. You're from such and such city. Your husband's name is such and such. You have this problem. It wasn't the word of knowledge. As a matter of fact, most of the time, it was just stuff that had nothing to do with anything other than telling them things that, that anybody could have found out somehow. Now, there was speculation that people had gotten a hold of information about people and was sending it to a microphone. But what was happening was they were getting huge offerings. PTL was not too big to fall because of the deception and the sin that was going on there. You say, but what about all? The, I mean, it was so big, and it hurt. It hurt the church. Um, people who used to give money wouldn't give wouldn't give money because all preachers now were a bunch of charlatans. Okay, so it hurt the work of God, but that's okay. God's big enough to recover, but he couldn't let that go on. That could not keep going. Well, they had that guy down there. I'm not going to call his name. If you used to watch it, you know who it is. Uh, and he was he would get up, and it was every night, every all the whole time, and the whole time the phone the phone lines. Wow, well, because people are drawn to the supernatural. They are drawn to the supernatural. Why? Because we are spirit beings. Which is why we must make sure that we walk in purity and integrity before the Lord so that we don't mishandle that which he entrusts us with. That Jesus be lifted up. That Jesus be glorified. That the honor and the praise goes to him. And not to us. We have to walk in purity. We can't be money grubbing dogs. Yes, we need money to run the church. We need money to build buildings. We need money to send out missionaries. We need money to support the kingdom. But we have to handle it in integrity. With the right heart understanding that we can't be manipulative. Now, folks, I, I know we had a season there. Everybody came up and put money in the preacher's pocket, throw it at them. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody came in our church. I was out of town. They preached and said, next time your pastor's back in, when your pastor can do this. And they, actually, they did it about twice, and I got to church. That I said, guys, I'm just not comfortable with this. I don't know if you all remember there, if you were there for that service. I just like. I'm not comfortable with this. Now, if you want to give me a Pentecostal handshake because you want to bless me, okay. But this walking up while we're in church and everybody's feeling the pressure to give because everybody else is doing it and putting money on in my pocket and all this while I'm trying to preach. I, I just, I wasn't even comfortable with it. I felt, I felt funny. Okay. It's one thing for God to speak to you and say, you know, pastor has a need, I want you to, I want you to do this. That's, that's a different thing altogether. But you ain't got to go do it in front of the church so that the next person will get up and go do it. The next person will get up and go do it. Then we can get up and talk about how much money we got. Hello. And most of the people that was happening with didn't need the money anyway. Their ministries had so much money in it, they didn't, you know, they didn't hardly know what to do with it. They didn't need an extra $45,000 that week for their personal lifestyle. 
Now, if you're giving $45,000 to pay toward the note of the building, that's not me personally. That's the church. That's a whole different thing. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? If you're taking care of the church, that's a different thing. But me personally, I cannot manipulate the anointing of God. Well, I get into impurity. And we'll short circuit it. And we'll cut off the flow of God. And it will cause it not to meet the needs of the people who need healing and need deliverance. There's not a person in this room who wouldn't like somebody to come up and drive up in your yard and give you a brand new thirty, forty thousand dollar car. I don't think anybody here would be going, doggone, I didn't want that. But in some circles, it's expected to do that. What's that got to do with miracles? Everything. Because if we don't keep the pipeline pure and keep it clean and keep it holy, we'll cut off the flow. It almost becomes expected that the pastor gets stuff that the church people can't even afford themselves. And I asked the question, but I asked it to myself, how can I take a $40,000 car, which that has never happened, from a congregation that maybe the vast majority of them out there are either taking public transportation or driving up to church in something that looks like the Beverly Hillbillies old car. Not the new one. Not the one they drove to California, the one they had before that. What does that look like? I don't know. It, they, it could drive it to California. It was that bad. Hello? Or how can I stop in the middle of miracles and receive an offering because I know people have been emotionally moved at that moment? Okay? We must keep things pure. So he offers them money, saying, um, give me the power that I, whosoever I lay my hands, they might receive the Holy Ghost. He was wanting to buy this. Why? Because he had made his living by supernatural manifestations. Now, they were demonic and sorceries, but he saw a new way to make money. And Peter said, you are under grace. The Lord doesn't judge thee in thy heart. Here is that power. Is that what he said? No. He said, Thy money perish with thee. Thou hast thought that the gift of God might be purchased with money. And you have neither part in a lot in this matter, or uh, logos, matter of utterance. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. And then Peter says, Repent of this thy wickedness. Or as a, um, in that movie, Polly, Polly Anna, now Polly, the, the remake of Polly Anna. Um, Polly, um, the preacher's that preacher in this field trying to work on his sermon. He goes, wickedness. He's They start getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. And, we'll, you know, we've taught this before. They start speaking in tongues. We can prove, you know, by, by, by biblical internal evidence, we know that what happened was they were speaking in tongues. The former sorcerer goes, man, I need that. Here, here's, here, here, here's 50. Give me that power. I can go make a living doing this. Because of our being off in areas in the past number of years. Now, Brother Hagen tried to stop excess prosperity with the Midas touch and rein that in and, and tell him you're getting out of you're getting out of line, you're getting out of balance. And they didn't listen. As a matter of fact, they rejected it, made fun of him. One guy said he thinks he's gone senile. Because he was in the meeting when he brought them all in to tell them they're getting off. 
Every, every one of them. I think he's gone senile. Now, what's going on? See, God wants to have a, a pure church for miracles, signs, and wonders that our heart is about people. Now, we say a lot about homosexuality before, because that is, it's, just, it's, it's rampant in our society now. It's everywhere. We're, we're now pushing into our schools to pervert the minds of children even into the third grade concerning gender identity and homosexuality, and they're teaching in, in middle school sex ed about uh, hom homosexual and lesbian sex and all this kind of stuff with graphic pictures, little flyers that have gr graphic pictures, putting books into the schools. So we are saying, because it is that spirit. It's really the spirit of Rome. Brother, Brother Sumrall said, I was sitting in the meeting when he said it, two of the major keys to the fall of Rome were litigation and homosexuality. This is 1980, folks, when he said, I was, he was at Rhema, and he was talking about that. Litigation and homosexuality. What do you do in America? You sue. You sue. You sue. You sue. We got, we got advertisers on television all day long. If you've experienced da 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 call the law firm of such and such, such and such. It's all day. And then we're, it, the, the perverseness of that, the LBGTQ plus whatever uh, agenda is out there. So that was, a, that was the two major things that caused the fall of the Roman Empire. And that same spirit's at work in America. Now, we do say a lot about it. The other side of this is not that we hate, because you're a hater if you don't agree with them. We love the homosexual. We love the lesbian. We love the uh, transgender, the non-binary, the binary, the, um, what's the other, the uh, queer is you, that's what the Q in LBGTQ is, is queer. Although if you use it, you're, you're being, um, you're using hate speech, okay? Um. I forgot some of the other terms. There's like 15 different words now in that. So that's just, they just put a plus on the end because you can't put up enough of letters. And that's the truth. It used to be the, the, um, the LBG community. Then it became the LBGT community. Then it became the LGBTQ community. Then it became the LBGTQ+. We love them. We will not acquiesce to the spirit that's in control of them. And we will preach the truth. Because that's the only thing that will liberate them. And the power of God to set them free. Amen. So though we do not agree and though we do not acquiesce and though do we do not use your preferred pronoun nor will i ever we think well you work you work uh, a job in, in a, in a uh, institution that says may, may says you have to the sixth circuit court of appeals on april in 2021 says i don't and that has not been moved up higher it says the educators cannot be forced They'll get, go against their deeply held religious beliefs and use pronouns that violate their deeply held religious beliefs. April 2021, Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. You can read the ruling. Because a woman sued the government, the school district, for forcing her and firing her because she wouldn't. And she won. Yeah. So, we're not going to acquiesce to the devil. Because if I acquiesce to the devil, then there's nobody to set you free. And you need liberty. You need to be free. Amen? So, all right. Philip went down there and preached. We're going to stop there. All right. Guys, everybody, thank you all for joining us tonight. We love you guys. We appreciate you. Um, join us again. Sunday, if you can't be here in person, we listen. We love you. We'd love to have you here Sunday. Um, for our um, homecoming and 
church building dedication. We're dedicating this building and land um, to, to the work of God that God's called Expedition Church to. And uh, the uh, and Reverend Tad Gregorich, Dean of Raymond Bible Training College in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, suburb of Tulsa, um, Kenneth Hagen Ministries, will be doing our dedication service. And so come on out and be with us. We'd love to have you. And uh, until then, remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. See you next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad.